Okay, here we go. This is what the new Elwyn Forest is. All right, I'm gonna turn. What's these crickets, man? Turn these fucking crickets off. The trees still look like shit. That looks really nice. Like that looks that looks really good. I like that. That's great. This is nice. Yeah, like if this MMO was coming out today, I'd be like, okay, this meets the graphic benchmark. I'm okay with this. This is good enough. Atmosphere is nice. Yeah, it's just those trees look like dog shit. That's Goldshire. Uh, I feel like the old Goldshire might look a little bit better than this. It looks a little bit more in uh, that plays the way the game used to play. Like, that's what I think people want. Now, if they made Classic like this and they made it play better uh, with, like, the new graphics and everything, like, I wouldn't complain about it, but it's not like I would care either. Uh, it's just not something that really matters that much to me. Season Mastery is already not Classic. They don't want Classic. No, but, like, the thing is, like, what does Classic mean like, I, I get like, oh, no changes, whatever. Like, Classic wasn't Classic because it had servers with 10,000 people. Like, that's not in vanilla WoW. Like, it had layering. Like, there's uh, d different, like, phases that came out. Like, they, they, look, it was different than it was back in 2005. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not, like, there's not an essence there that is to be captured. And I think that there is an essence, an essence uh, to be captured in in Classic WoW. It's not the graphics, however, I think. Uh, I think it is the more laid-back, relaxed, simplistic, and uh, e easier, truthfully, easier game in, in, in like, a competitive regard. Uh, I think that's what people are really looking for with Classic WoW is you look at something like this, this looks really cool. And if they did a Season of Mastery that looked like this, I'd like that. But would that cause me to play the game? That's the truth. Would this cause me to play the game? No, it would not. Uh, it just looks nice, and that's about it, man. It's just nostalgic. Yeah, and it's a great nostalgia trip. It absolutely is. But that's really all it's about, man. So, yeah, that's the way I look at it. Uh, it's gone because everyone knows the content. Yeah, and that's the thing. is people like, I want new content in Classic WoW. Like, I want them to fucking open the Dragon Isles. Open characters.
I can't loot that. I can't cast that yet.
I need to get closer. It's too far away. I'm out of range. My mana is low. I need to get closer. It's too far away.
Yo.
It's too far away. I need to get closer.
that spell isn't ready yet. Still recharging. What can I do for you? Or the Alliance?
What can I do for you? Safe travel. King's honor, friend. Light bless you. Hey there. Have a good one. Have a good one. Greetings. See you later. Greetings. Be careful.
need help? Safe travels. Urzan Crips. Like, open uh, Grim Batal. Like, give us these, these things that were supposed to be in Classic WoW, but they didn't make it. Like, I, I want Classic Plus. I want Classic Plus with uh, improved features, with new worlds. Uh, the vanilla Ice Crown uh, that we saw in Warcraft 3. Uh, those are the things that I really want to see, man. So, uh, just uh, release Legion without RNG legendaries, and that's it. Game revived Omega Wall. There's a place known go. as the Dragon Isles, okay. which was eventually... The undead were originally supposed to look more... human-like? In an interview with the Vanilla WoW developer, they talk about how the undead were originally planned to basically decay over time. They were supposed to start off looking human, and then slowly as they progressed through the starting zone, they would lose their flesh, culminating at the end of the starting zone where the Forsaken would look like the ones we have today. That's but they're actually really cool. That would actually be really cool. That's awesome. It just didn't happen. The reason they abandoned yeah, this feature was because they just did not have the tech to pull it off at the it time. Was and also, the undead areas were the last ones to be added to the original game. So they yeah. definitely did not have time to flesh out the zone where they were really like their ambitious pre planning stages. Too Although, bad. it would have been a neat feature to have lore wise to see the undead slowly decay as you come to terms with your character's new existence. Yeah. And they kind of pulled this off with the Worgen starting zone, oh. where you start off as a human and then slowly turn into a Worgen. Yeah. Although, the Worgen have the so. ability to swap between their human That's form anyway. Way, and they already have human models in the game. I always so. thought the Worgen, like the entry level, uh, like the storyline for Worgen was really good. Like, I, I actually liked it. It had like cinematics to it. It had like characters that were important. Like it was, it was very well put together. I, I liked it a lot. That one was a no brainer to add to their starting zone. And also, did you know, if you leave the Worgen starting zone before you get bit by a Worgen, you just automatically learn how to turn into a Worgen once you enter combat for the first time. It used to be you could stay in human form forever if you managed to escape, but they fixed that after a couple of expansions. Yeah, that would make sense. Located in the Death Knight starting zone are a series of skeleton NPCs known as the Scourge Sky Darkeners, okay. whose only job is to rain arrows upon the nearby town the Death Knight are attacking. One of the skeletons will offer you a quest Bunch called Tonight We Dine in Havenshire, which has you go around the town in order to collect some of the Serenite arrows that they've been raining down because they're only found in Northrend and they're in limited supply. Okay. Now, this quest, as well as the NPCs, are all obvious references to the movie 300, as one of the lines in the movies is, Spartans, ready your breakfast and eat hearty, for tonight we dine in hell. And also, there's a scene in the movie where the Persian army threatens the Spartans by saying they have so many soldiers on their the side that their the arrows shade. will blot out the sun, yeah. to which they reply that they'll just fight in the shade then. Hence the name of the Sky Darkeners of the Bowman Skeleton. Which is just Whenever I bought my TV, uh, whenever I worked at the IRS back in the day, the first movie I ever watched on my big screen TV was Safe 300. Travels. Reinforced by the name of the quest that they provide. In Alpha WoW, before they had talent trees which went live in the classic version of the game, all players had this talent point interface, which would allow you to spend your talent <laughs> points in order to increase the power level of your character. Fuck like if you that. wanted to increase the damage with two-handed axes specifically, oh God. you could spend 10 talent points to increase it by one. If yeah. you wanted some fire resistance, you could spend 10 this talent like points the, to increase the pet, it by four, uh, pet UI. increasing it as you bought more of the ranks. This system is also where you would get your professions. So you'd have to choose to give up player power in order to be able to craft items and consumables. Oh my god. Eventually the system was scrapped, yeah, and then players that. were given the talent trees in beta, which stayed in the game all the way until Mist of Pandaria. Although the uh, Destruction Warlocks, didn't they used to have uh, in like the alpha a talent called Holocaust? Hey like I'm pretty sure they did, right? Yeah, it was Holocaust. Yeah, it was a real... Uh, it's like, yeah, it's around. got another definition, and it doesn't necessarily mean the thing that happened in the 40s. But why don't we just come up with another name anyway, man? This little window of purchasing specific skills wasn't entirely abandoned either, as the hunter <laughs> class had a very similar window in order to train their pets. Yeah. Whereas yeah, when your pet would level thing. up, they would gain loyalty points, which you would then use to purchase their basic attacks, cooldowns, and all of their extra stats, yep. like granting extra armor, health, and very specific resistances. So you could choose to give your pet a lot of fire resistance and have no frost resistance at all, for example. Mm -hmm. And the original pet training panel was incredibly unintuitive and would show you skills that you couldn't actually I train. I could never figure it out. Like, honestly, I remember uh, Zach had a hunter, his, his hunter's name was Orc Boy, and we had, like, a level fucking 25 crab, 
and we couldn't train this thing for shit. Like, we didn't know how it works. It's like, well, we go to, uh, so, uh, uh, we go to the pet trainer, and he's got a bunch of green things, but why would I want him to have armor? Because I want him to attack. Oh, bro. Like, oh my god. Do you want to go to 7 Eleven, man? And then the crab never got training. Basically, that's what happened. Yeah, the crab never, never really made much progress. Your active pet and didn't have a way to sort the abilities at all. So just kind of a mess that was abandoned in Wrath of the Lich King. So yeah. they did kind of keep the old talent point system. It was just stripped of its previous functionalities like and the only applied trees. to hunter I thought they pets. were really cool. Located in Area 52 during the second to last quest of the quest chain provided by Dr. Vomisa PhD is a quest known as You Robot which has you test drive a robot against another one named Negatron. I now, during the quest, quest chain, you've basically been helping this guy test drive his robots yeah. and gathering parts for him. This so, during this garbage. final test drive of the robot, you're supposed to fight against a Fel Reaver who is an obvious reference to Megatron, the big bad evil guy of the Transformer series, yeah. which is a cartoon and movie franchise about robots that could transform to different things. I, I know that. During the Burning Crusade, this was a pretty difficult quest to solo and was supposed was. to be helped along by the robot that was provided by you, which could be accidentally dismissed if you summoned another temporary pet as part of your class. Yeah. Now, the enemy bad guy Negatron also has quest. some dialogues which are very reminiscent of his Saturday morning cartoon villain status that it's based on, where he'll say things like, Ha ha ha, your feeble rocket is destroyed. I'll return later to finish off the rest of your puny town. I remember that. He says yeah, it's whenever caps, you failed the course. quest, right? And the quest it's associated to is itself a reference to the short story and full-length movie, I, Robot. Which doesn't really have well, any... I remember, like, it was like every, like, six months to eight months, Will Smith would come out with a new movie. And, like, back in, like, the late 90s, the early 2000s, we would all go to see it. Like, it doesn't matter, like, what... Welcome, Traveler, to the Grand Bazaar! We have many rare items and trinkets for you to acquire. This one, 700 gold pieces. Or can I interest you in this one? 300 gold pieces. This one, not for sale. Hello? I love you. I think you laid it on a teensy bit thick there, old pal. Hey everyone, I'm Jordy, and I play in the Guild Fusion on Benediction. We cleared Black Temple and Mount Hydral quite a bit on the PTR in the last couple weeks, and I learned some stuff that I think might be helpful to anyone looking to make their first clears as pain-free as possible. Some of these you might know, some you probably won't, but if you learn anything, do me a favor and toss a like and subscribe so I know you like this kind of stuff, and I won't just go back to raid logging like everybody else. Alright, number one, what trash can you safely skip? So coming out of Nagentis' room, as you can see, this is where the pipe is. You kill these two on the right, and then you really need everything along this road. These are the fear bringers, and then there's this patrol here that you should pull. And then you fight the boss about here. Um, as you can see, these guys, everything over here. Uh, you can avoid all the stuff on the right, and then all the stuff on the back left. This is the entrance from Supremus's room. These two demon packs, you can actually skip this left one if you hug the right, like so. Um, just make sure that you pull the patrol and the uh, pack here back towards the entrance because this is on the way to Gorefiend. That's from the Yakama room. You go up these two sets of stairs, and then on your left is this pack, which you're about to see, which... Uh, you can skip if you hug this corner and then you can also skip this skeleton pack and the channelers if you hug this corner um, Which I'll show right here. This is the pack on the left that you skip you hug the right we accidentally pulled this This is the one I was talking about the second one the skeleton one if you hug this corner right here You can just run right by This is the room outside of Gorefiend uh, as you come up this this ramp you can skip this first humanoid pack right here You just hug the left around you can actually skip this pack, but I would highly recommend against it for your first clear. Um, this is the one you skip. You hug the left, go around, um, like so. And uh, just be careful not to uh, pull it. I'm a little bit too close, but it's fine. You can pull this, you just run right through, um, and then you're at Gorefiend. 
This is the room for Reliquary of Souls and Gertog. Uh, this is the doorway from Akama's center room. You can actually skip this first humanoid pack and the two dogs. As long as you move around this right corner while the, the green dog is at the back of the pack. It patrols around. Uh, this is the dog you want to avoid. If it's on the back of the pack, you can go right around. Uh, otherwise, it will pull. I wouldn't recommend this one week one, but uh, it's definitely skippable. And finally, this is the room towards uh, Illidari Council. Up here is where Mother is. You kill the uh, mechs up the ramp, you kill this mech, and then there's three humanoid packs. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, we've marked it, but this is actually one you can skip. You pull this right one here, and then this one, and then you're good to go. You just run through the door after that, and uh, you will be safe. All right, tip number two, arcane bombs. There are trash mobs in Mount High Jaw called Shadowy Necromancers, which you can see marked with X, Skull, and Diamond here. Uh, they'll often target one person as they arrive in the wave, and it can be difficult to get to stack up for the AoE damage. Uh, we outfitted our melee and tanks with these arcane bombs, which are old oral engineering bombs. I need to target something first.
That ability isn't ready yet.
cast that yet. Can't do that yet.
I can't cast it. Still recharging. I need a target.
Red still recharging. isn't ready yet.
can't cast that yet. That spell isn't ready yet. Well met. See you around.
good day to you. See you later. Hello. See you around. Uh, that silence, which is very effective to get them to into the stack uh, to stop casting. Um, they also work on the little aqueous spawns um, in Nagentis' room um, to silence them. It cuts their damage by like 75%. It makes it pretty trivial. Um, there might be more uses for these. If you can find any, let me know in the comments. So tip number three is to LOS the gargoyles in this horde camp. Uh, the gargoyles spawn in the back. Uh, on waves 2, 4, and 6 on Khazragal and wave 2 on Asgalore. They're totally a pain in the ass to attack because they like to stay flying and attack from a huge range. Uh, we learned if you can get aggro on them, use hunters, warlocks, even the healers, if you drag them to this spot around this tower, um, you can get a good stack going and then you can cleave and AoE them pretty efficiently. Um, these things are annoying as hell, so anything to simplify it helps a lot. All right, tip number four, Terran Gorefiend macros. Um, most everyone's played the little mini game to learn how to operate the ghosts, but we found that until you're actually using the things, people often don't think about which bars or keybinds they have set up for the pet bars. These macros, which I've also written out below, will make the entire process much less difficult because it's just using your current one through seven keys as the pet bar. So you don't have to worry about where your pet bar is or fiddle with any keybinds. First, your main three abilities are located on your three, four, and five keys on that pet bar. So whatever you use for your three to five currently, make sure make a macro that includes these exact lines. These should be before any spells that you currently have on there. Slash click, space, pet action button three, four, five, etc. Note this is case sensitive. Uh, please be aware also that these won't work for hunters because they use pets all the time and don't want to be hitting random pet buttons in raid. So you can replace them with these. I think you could also use these for, for, for everybody, but, uh, we've been using click pet action button. If you have any questions about how exactly to do the Gorfine mini game, check the link below for the browser game. Uh, Hello everyone. Well, we know him as an epic war chief and hero to many. For those origins, they begin in a time of great turmoil. It was the time in which Kill Jaden of the Burning Legion manipulated the orcs into abandoning the elements in exchange for fell magic and formed the hordes. All that so that they could be used to exterminate the Draenei on their world of Draenor. But the orcs didn't know this. They thought that they were following the guidance and wisdom of their ancestors. Just a few of them kept their eyes open looked around and saw the changes that were happening to their planets and their people, figured that this wasn't right. Amongst those few orcs were Thrall's parents, Duratan and Draka of the Frostwolf clan. They tried to speak out, they tried to protect their people, but there was no hiding for the oncoming storm and the plans of the Legion would be carried out. When the Horde finally did manage to exterminate Prophet Velen and the Draenei, or at least so Kil'jaeden fought, he abandoned them to their fate. 
left them behind on a broken, corrupted world, where basic needs such as food and water were very hard to come by. Devouring demonic blood and using the fell also had its effects on the orcs, both inside and out, and they were turning on each other. Something had to change real fast, and luckily for the orcs, the legion wasn't done with them quite yet. Their leader Sargeras figured that they could use the orcs for another plan, for weakening a little planet known as Azeroth, a world that the Burning Legion desperately wanted to conquer. Under his guidance, the Dark Portal was created, and the Horde invaded Azeroth. Speaking out against all the things that had happened, it did mean that the Frost Wolves eventually got exiled. But seeing how their actions, how their curse even passed on to their children, Duratan and Draka could not stay away, could not let their people be misguided by these dark forces. A secret meeting with their longtime friend Orgrim Doomhammer. It had to make plans of usurping leadership, steering them away from this doomed path. A secret meeting, but not completely unknown. There was a spy within Orgrim's clan who led Draka and Duratan right into the hands of assassins. Trying to save their people would result in their demise. An orphan young Fro, or Goel as his parents would have named him. This name Fro, meaning slave, it was given to him by the man that found him abandoned in the wilds. A dayless Blackmoor came across this gruesome sight. A bunch of dead orcs and an infant left to die, resisting his instincts to immediately slay the child. Adelis instead decided to take him with him and raise him as a gladiator. This took place just before the first war ended, and Adelis would become quite the distinguished veteran of the second war, the war over Azeroth, which was won by the Alliance. And the defeated orcs, they either ran back home, they were slain on the spot, they hid away in small pockets on the world, or they surrendered. Those that chose the last option found themselves locked away within internment camps, and Adeus' reputation it had earned him leadership over these prisons, and that's where Fro would spend his childhood. At least, if they could manage to keep him alive. The ugly little thing it wouldn't eat had grown pale and quiet over the last several days. The beast was dying, which had enraged Blackmore. Now the answer to his survival came from Tarifa Foxton. Her father had been Blackmore's servant for 10 years now and was discussing Thrall's situation with his wife, who served in the kitchens. She help. had recently given birth to a baby boy, and while listening in, Tarifa thought that the answer was obvious. They were trying to feed a little baby meat. But that's not what babies eat. They drink milk like her baby brother did. Adelis had not even considered this, and that's the way orcs were viewed by so many. So alien, so monstrous, that they didn't even consider that there might be similarities. From the mouth of a child came their answer, and after pleading with his wife for a bit, Mrs. Foxton was willing to feed Fro. Sadly, Tarifa's little brother died of a fever, and when Fro was old enough to eat a vile concoction of blood, cow's milk and porridge with his own small hands, the guards took him away as well. Tarifa cried then. One brother had passed away. The other was now taken away. She got smacked for the efforts and pretended to never talk about Frau again. To the outside, she appeared to be the ever obedient child. But she vowed that she would never forget this strange creature that had almost been like a younger brother to her. Never. She would be one of the few bright lights in Frau's gruesome life. He wasn't exactly treated with respect or kindness by Blackmore and the others, as they trained him to become a powerful gladiator. The one in charge of his training was a bit of an exception. This was a massive human going by the name of Sergeant. He had trained thousands of recruits, in which each group he offered them the same challenge. Rip his earring from his ear, and they will be allowed to See beat him to a pulp. Without warning, Sergeant came at the untrained, unexperienced Thrall. But something inside of him clicked in place. His bulky form always made him feel sluggish and clumsy. Fear of upsetting his master Blackmore or doing something wrong. But here in the arena, within battle, his vision narrowed to one single goal. Kill Sergeant. And he got really close. Sergeant's experience and speed it did give him a good run for his money. But not even that was enough to hold back the might of this orc. He had nearly squeezed the life out of his trainer. Thinking to himself... If, if only I could get my hands around Blackmore's neck. And that thought made him hesitate, giving the others the chance to throw I him off the sergeant. The Yet sergeant place. wasn't mad. Quite the opposite. He praised Frau for getting closer than any had before. But in his rage, he has forgotten about his true objective. 
His bloodlust would serve him well in some fights. But in the arena, he would have to be more present, more inside his mind rather than his guts. Some foes will have to be slain, while others will have to be spared. Thrall dared to ask the question on his mind. Sergeant, sometimes... You said sometimes you don't kill. Why not? Sergeant regarded him evenly. It's called mercy, Thrall, he How said quietly. And you'll learn about that too. Mercy. Under his breath, Thrall turned a word over his tongue. It was a sweet word. And perhaps Blackmore should have learned it as well. Beatings from his often one. drunk master were not uncommon for our Thrall, nor was he ever allowed to forget that he was a slave. Later on, another plan formed in Adelis' mind. If he could teach Thrall a little bit more, some tactics, how to read, how to lead, then he could use his slave gladiator to lead the rest of the imprisoned orcs. Not for the greatness of the Alliance, mind you, but for his own gain and power. He could already envision it, ruling from up high. In a different timeline, he might have been successful. Now the one ordered to bring for all the books to study with, that was Tarifa, who also snuck in a small, tightly folded piece of parchment. A little note letting him know that she had not forgotten about him. The beginning of many secret letters sent between the human and the orc. Through her letters, Thrall's mind was open to a world beyond his cell. A world of art and beauty and companionship. A world of food beyond rotting meat and slop. A world in which he had a place. He knew that Tari did not have a privileged life. She was a servant in her own way. As much in Thrall as the orc who bore the name. But she did have friends, and she was not spat upon, and she belonged somewhere. Thrall had no people of his own. The only thing that he had left to remind himself of the days with his parents. There was a fraying square of cloth that bore the symbol of a white wolf head on a blue field. Now he could not just walk up to Blackmore and tell him that he was done being a slave. That he was ready to find his own family. And so Thrall remained where he was fighting his battles in the arena, earning great victories for his master. Things went rather well for Blackmore, and the reputation of his pet orc spread far and wide. One time, he had Thrall fight nine matches in a row. Eight of those, his pet orc had won, each victory bringing home more gold. The ninth was ill-advised. Even Sargent told Blackmore to let Thrall rest, that it was enough for today, nice to but the drunk Adelis wouldn't hear it. His slave, being tired and injured, was pitted against a massive ogre who kicked the absolute crap out of him, beating Thrall to an inch of his life. The fighters were separated and Thrall was brought back to his prison. He expected healers to come, as they always did. Sure enough, he had lost the final match, but he did have earned victory in eight of them, something that he had never done before. But the healers were not the first ones to show up. A severely drunk Blackmore was pissed. A thousand gold he had lost because of Thrall. Despite his injuries, Blackmore started to kick him and did not stop until the next group came in. A group of guards took their turn beating him up. And this was the thing that broke our Thrall. Broke the chains of his mind that bound him to Adelis. Sergeant had shown up as soon as he heard about the beating and pulled the guards of an unconscious Thrall. He woke up to the healers, and Sergeant gave him praise. Was impressed on how he had performed, but it was too little and too late. Never again would he let himself be used like that. Once, he would have cringed and vowed to be better. To do something to earn the love and respect that he so desperately craved. Now, he knew that he would never find it here. Not as long as Blackmore owned him. He reached for his writing tools and wrote a note to the only person that he could trust. Hurry. On the next dark moons, I planned to escape. She was at his side, of course, risking it all to buy him his freedom. A fire was started to distract the guards. A massive black cloak was already waiting for him to hide him in the night. Thrall escaped the place that had kept him imprisoned for so many years and reunited with his sister in spirits. For ten years now, they'd been riding one another, and now she could finally hug him again. There wasn't a lot of time to talk though, but enough time to realize that her life with Blackmore wasn't easy either. She was the mistress to this cruel man, and hearing what her life with him was like, it filled Thrall with outrage. She couldn't escape with him though, her life was here in Durnhold, for his journey was to find his people. They call you a monster, but they're the monsters, not you. Farewell, Thrall.
for the first time. Our young Thrall tastes freedom on the quest of finding where he came from, finding where he belonged. It would be best to find other free orcs in the wild, but he wasn't even sure if those were still a thing. Tarifa had also been kind enough to he mark out the other internment camps so that he could avoid them as the best world. as he could, and our Thrall set out for one of those immediately. Along the way, he does get captured by humans that bring him back to one of these camps, which works out rather nicely, except for all of his stuff getting stolen. Inside, he gets to witness the absolute horrible conditions that his people lived in. Huddled everywhere were dozens, perhaps hundreds of orcs. Some of them sat in puddles of their own filth, their eyes unfocused, their sharp tusked jaws slack. Others paced back and forth, muttering incoherently. Some slept tightly curled up on the earth, seeming not to care even if they were stepped on. There was an occasional squabble, but even that apparently sapped too much energy, for it died down almost as quickly as it begun. This demonic curse that was running through the orc's veins, it had quite the side effects, and he got to chat with few of them, learning more about their history with the Legion, and soon enough he realized that it wasn't the walls or the guards that kept the orcs imprisoned. They had the strength and they had the numbers to fight their way out of there. What they truly lacked was the fire, the will to do so. If he was going to set his people free, he would have to be their fire. Soon enough, word reached Blackmore that the other camp might have his pet orc. With his arrival and a distraction, Thrall manages to use the opportunity to just climb over the walls and get out of there. He was told that Gromash Hellscream and the Warsong clan were still free, were still fighting. They were his next target to find, and soon enough he finds himself being tested to see if he was even worthy to speak with Grum. Light First, with a you. test of his fighting skills, which our experienced gladiator managed to win. He did not kill them though, despite that being the custom for the war songs. Then the second test, a test of will, in which they presented him a small human child. Not a threat to them right Sure, we've all heard of the odd mind-controlling nebula or sentient spaceship, but there are certain things that Starfleet encounter on their travels which should, by all accounts, fundamentally change everything about philosophy, life and our place in the universe, only to be completely forgotten about the next week. With that in mind, I'm Ellie with Trek Culture and let's take a look at the 10 biggest discoveries made in Star Trek that no one cared about. Number 10 multiple methods of immortality. Starfleet has managed to drastically increase the human life expectancy from 80 years in our time to around 120 years in the time of the next generation. However, humans still have to die along with most other known species in the universe. The thing is though, they really shouldn't have to. Throughout the history of Star Trek, humanity has discovered dozens of methods of increasing the human lifespan or just flat out cheating death. From the Borg nanoprobes used to resurrect Neelix in the Voyager episode Mortal Coil, to the transporter accident in the Next Generation episode Rascals, which reverts several officers back into children. The list goes on and on. If you really feel like it, you could even pull a Kirk and jump into the next temporal nexus that comes along and live a hundred years in a psychedelic trance-like state of pure happiness. Until Picard comes in, pulls you back into reality only for you to die ten minutes later. None of these methods are used beyond a couple of episodes. There are so many possibilities of immortality in the Star Trek universe, and yet no one ever bothers to look into them. Perhaps the only true way to live forever is to have your name in the intro credits. Number 9. Whales beat humans to first contact. 
In Star Trek IV, A Voyage Home, we learn that humans were not the first life on Earth to make contact with aliens. Earth's whales had been communicating across the universe with alien life using their whale songs before going extinct due to hunting. Unfortunately, even after Kirk and the crew return whales back to their time, we never learn why these aliens were so interested in them. For a long time, the closest we get to some follow-up on this came from the Next Generation Enterprise D blueprint, which showed multiple two-deck high water tanks in the middle of the saucer section labelled Cetacean Navigation Lab, cetacean being a word for whales and dolphins. This suggests that whales and other cetaceans now work alongside humans in the time of the next generation and assist in navigation in their own specialised habitats. <laughs> Finally, to the applause of many diehard fans, after being teased in Lower Decks episode Second Contact, we finally got to see the fabled ops in the second season, along with some horny belugas, at last solidifying it in canon. Still, you would think that if most Federation starships had multiple two-storey water tanks in them filled with whales, you that we'd see something? them by now. Number 8. Aliens Manipulated Earth's History Throughout humanity's history on Star Trek, there have been many instances of aliens interfering in our development, and effectively breaking the Prime Directive before it was cool. Sometimes it's minor, such as when T'Pol's ancestor in Enterprise episode Carbon Creek crash-landed on Earth in the 50s and introduced humanity to Velcro. Other times, it can profoundly change our history. In the Voyager episode Death Wish, Janeway learns that a member of the Q Continuum was responsible for the apple falling on Isaac Newton's head in the 17th century, leading to him developing his laws of gravity. Despite learning that a superintelligent alien entity was secretly guiding human history, Janeway simply moves on by the next scene. Q is actually actively training humanity throughout the next generation by putting us on trial, effectively controlling the course of history by teaching Picard and the Enterprise D crew some of his many lessons. There are some other examples such as the Preservers and the Skagarans. The point is though, First Contact definitely did not take place on the 5th of April 2063, at least not for everyone. Number 7. Some dinosaurs escaped extinction and became sentient. So, not only were humans not the first intelligent life on Earth, neither were whales. In the Voyager episode Distant Origin, we learn that about 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period, a species of hadrosaurs survived the mass extinction of the dinosaurs and escaped Earth to eventually evolve into the Voth, a humanoid reptilian empire with technologies far beyond the Federation. The Voth actively tried to suppress this knowledge, which explains why none of them seem interested in their lost home. But after this one episode, Starfleet never makes any attempt to learn any more about their distant cousins. Perhaps they simply fear the repercussions of questioning the dogma of the Voth, as we have seen that their technological power far exceeds most species in the galaxy. Number 6. Warp Travel Damages Space in the Next Generation episode Force of Nature, Hikaran scientists show research to the Federation that suggests that high-speed warp travel slowly damages the fabric of space-time, and that if nothing was done, their region of space would be rendered uninhabitable. The Federation initially rejects their finding until one scientist sacrifices herself in a warp core breach, proving that it does in fact cause substantial damage to space. The Federation immediately puts laws in place to ban travel beyond warp factor 5, except in emergencies, and to restrict damaged regions of space to essential travel only. Sounds good, right? Except the Federation actually never enforces these laws. We see countless ships go past warp 5 after this episode, and most of the time there's absolutely no emergency to speak of. Voyager gets a pass. And let's not forget that Earth is a major hub of tourism, with ships warping in and out of the system every second. So really, the space around Earth should be totally decimated by now. Number 5. Nanoprobes in the last few seasons of Voyager, Seven of Nine's Borg nanoprobes became the writer's favourite solution to pretty much any problem. As mentioned earlier, they revive Neelix from the dead in the episode Mortal Coil, 
And as we see from the episode Course Oblivion, they can also improve warp capabilities. Unfortunately though, only a fake copy of the crew were able to figure this out right before dying. The list goes on and on. In the episode Friendship 1, nanoprobes are used to heal radiation burns better than any medication on the ship. And in the episode Someone to Watch Over Me, they're used to cure an ambassador of his drunkenness by literally attacking the molecules of synthahol in his bloodstream. Unfortunately for all the crew of Voyager who died after Neelix, these methods were never used again. While it is true that Seven of Nine possessed only a limited number of nanoprobes, Starfleet have encountered numerous dead Borg drones and not once thought to salvage their nanoprobes even after Voyager learned of their powers. Number 4. The Centre of the Galaxy Earth is 25,800 light years away from the centre of the Milky Way. That's over a third of the distance of Voyager's 70,000 light year journey that is supposed to take them roughly 70 years. And yet, in the infamous Star Trek V The Final Frontier, the Enterprise makes it there in less than a day. Well, let's ignore that tiny detail just for a second and talk about the fact that when the Enterprise does reach the centre of the Milky Way, they don't find a supermassive black hole that's millions of times the mass of the Sun, but instead a swirly energy field surrounding a planet that is solely inhabited by a giant head who likes to cosplay as God. The Klingons proceed to blow him up as the crew escapes and no one ever returns. But who was this entity? Why does he need a starship so much? Are there any more of him? And why is the centre of a galaxy an energy field surrounding a planet? At the very least, Voyager could have checked it out on their way back. Number 3. The many better alternatives to warp travel. Spore drive. Borg Transwarp Conduit Quantum Slipstream Drive. All of these are examples of propulsion systems far superior to warp travel in every way, and probably less damaging to space. Unfortunately, all of these alternate technologies fall into development hell and end up never being in widespread use, despite being proven effective if done right. It shouldn't be too hard for Starfleet to reverse engineer time warp technologies from a salvaged Borg cube, for example. But usually, after one failed attempt that usually ends in catastrophe, they scrap the whole idea and usually classify it too. Then of course there's Captain Janeway, who instead of studying the Caretaker Array to perhaps learn how to control it, decides to blow it up to keep it from the Kazon. Aside from some Well met. Go with honor, friend. King's honor, friend. For the Alliance. Need something? See you around. King's honor, friend.
Hello. Farewell. minor improvements, Starfleet's warp engines have operated on the same basic principles from the time of Zephyr and Cochrane's first faster-than-light flight in 2063, all the way to Star Trek Picard in 2399. It definitely seems like it's time for an upgrade. Number 2. All humanoid species share a common ancestor. In the Next Generation episode The Chase, several Alpha Quadrant species come together and realise that fragments of all their DNA, when combined, produce a holographic message of an ancient humanoid species that claims to be the ancestor of all humanoid life in the galaxy. Apparently, they were the first life in this part of the galaxy and in their loneliness decided to seed thousands of planets with their genetic code, leading life on all these planets to develop towards a common humanoid body type. While this was clearly just an excuse for the low-budget aliens who were clearly people in lizard suits with a bit of junk stuck on their forehead, the implications of this within the Star Trek universe are profound. The Klingons and Cardassians reject this news out of disgust, but the Romulans and the Federation are not only open to the idea, but convinced, with the Romulan commander saying to Picard, Perhaps humans and Romulans are not so dissimilar after all. Despite this, this revelation never comes up in any political or historical discussions. I mean, all humanoid life in the universe is related. Number 1. Q The Q continuum doesn't have a beginning. It has always simply been. They are nothing short of gods, other than the slight difference that they don't know everything. But they can read minds, so don't think you can hide anything from them. Each Q possesses complete and total control over all space, matter and time in the universe. They can change the course of history on a whim or reduce entire stars to dust. So why is it that Starfleet typically reacts to the arrival of Q with nothing more than slight annoyance? All captains of Starfleet are briefed on Q and his abilities and told not to play into his games. But here he is, displaying powers beyond belief and able to solve any problem with ease, and the crew of the Enterprise don't even think to ask him some questions. Such as, where do we go when we die? How does the universe end? Sisko cares so little about his godlike abilities that he literally punches him in the face. Starfleet treats him like just a simple nuisance to put up with. Janeway got transported back to before the Big Bang by Q and barely reacted. Even Riker, upon gaining the powers of the Q, treats it like nothing more than a cool party trick. And there you have it, that's 10 discoveries made on Star Trek that no one cares about. If you can think of any that weren't mentioned in this video, then comment them below and while you're there, like and subscribe and tap that notification bell. You can also head over to Twitter to follow us there, and I can be found across various social medias just by searching Ellie Little Child. By the mid 1990s, the Star Trek franchise had seemingly done the impossible once again. Star Trek The Next Generation began life looked down on by most of pop culture and diehard Trek fans who proclaimed any new show without Kirk, Spock, and McCoy was borderline blasphemy. However, by its fifth year, The Next Generation had proven its detractors wrong, with an average audience of 10 million viewers coming to see it as must-watch television, and pop culture at large now saw the show as the new definitive version of Star Trek. Its success was incredibly impressive, but while audiences had eventually accepted a new crew on a new enterprise going boldly where no one has gone before, surely the idea of a Star Trek show confined to a static space station could never hope to pull off the same trick for a third time. Star Trek The Next Generation was an unabashed smash hit for the franchise and for its owners. The familiar trio of Kirk, Spock and McCoy now had real competition as cultural icons from the new crew of the Enterprise D. And in contrast to the franchise's first television outing, The Next Generation commanded a massive regular audience and was a huge money maker for Paramount Television. The executives of the studio had regarded Star Trek as their crown jewel property for many years, and as they were riding high on the success of The Next generation, they approached executive like producers this. Rick Berman and showrunner Michael Piller about the possibility of creating yet another Star Trek spin-off show. 
To differentiate this third spin-off from the hit TNG, executive Brandon Tartikoff was the one to suggest a more stationary setting rather than another Trek show following a spaceship. Tartikoff brought up the wagon train inspiration behind the original series and The Next Generation, saying, If The Next Generation was wagon train in space, this new show has to be the rifleman in space, a man and his son coming to a dilapidated frontier town on the edge of civilization. At first, Berman and Pillar considered setting the new show in a Federation colony before eventually settling on a space station for budgetary reasons. As various ideas were thrown what around the writer's room, the name of the station was decided as Deep Space Nine. At first, this wasn't intended as the overall title of the show, with Berman preferring the title Star Trek The Final Frontier. However, Deep Space Nine had simply stuck in conversation. As development of the show continued, Michael Pillar realised this new type of setting would mean a significant change in the way they approached their Star Trek stories. He said, We felt that there was an opportunity to really look deeper, more closely at the workings of the Federation, and by putting it on a space station where they would be forced to confront the kinds of issues that people in spaceships are not forced to confront. In a series that focuses on a ship like the Enterprise, you live week by week. You never have to stay and deal with the issues that you've raised. But by focusing on a space station, you create a show about commitment. It's like the difference between a one-night stand and a marriage. As Berman and Pillar continued to develop the show, they began to assemble the writing team for the series. Ira Stephen Bear, who had previously written for The Next Generation's third season, was the first to join as he previously functioned effectively as Michael Pillar's second-in-command in the writer's room on TNG. Robert Hewitt Wolf also joined the team among many others. Something which the writers mutually agreed with Pillar on was to create a cast of characters with far more interpersonal conflict with each other. During The Next Generation, Gene Roddenberry had famously created an edict of no workplace conflict on the Enterprise. His reasoning being that by the 24th century, human beings had evolved beyond petty squabbles. In the early years of The Next Generation, however, this hampered many writers who felt they had no avenue to create compelling drama, which is more often than not built on conflict. While Michael Pillar had found a way of eventually creating this much-needed conflict when he took over as showrunner, this conflict still had severe limitations imposed on it. By the time Deep Space Nine was in early development, Roddenberry was in ill health and so had no direct involvement with the series. The writers, wanting to be respectful of Roddenberry's original edict, came up with a clever way to get around this limitation by adding more alien non-Starfleet characters. While devising the larger setting for the show, Pillar suggested utilising the Cardassians as they had been well received by audiences of the next generation and were popular among the writing staff as well. The recurring character of Ro Laren had also been extremely well received, and so the writers decided the fallout of the Cardassian occupation of Bajor provided the perfect backdrop for this western-inspired frontier station. Already Deep Space Nine was shaping up to be a marked departure from the Star Trek norm. It was stationary rather than exploratory, taking place on the edge of civilization and rife with conflict. The key to making sure long-time Trekkies and newcomers would accept something so different was certainly the characters. For the first officer of this station, originally Michael Pillar and Rick Berman wanted to bring Ro Laren over to Deep Space Nine as her character effectively introduced audiences to the Cardassian occupation of Bajor. However, actress Michelle Forbes declined the role, instead wanting to focus on breaking into feature films and didn't want to commit to a potentially long-running series. Therefore, the writers used Laren as inspiration to create the character of Major Kieran Rees. Ultimately, the writers found this helped them in their goal of creating more interpersonal conflict by having having a first officer outside of Starfleet. Actress Nana Visitor landed the role after a strong audition. She later reflected on the audition saying, The role piqued my interest because it wasn't a mother or a wife or a prostitute or a killer. Kira was fully realised. I decided to remain in character as Kira throughout the audition process. I later heard the producers thought I was perfect for the role, but thought I'd be a nightmare to work with. Nana Visitor was born at Nana Tucker adopting the surname Visitor several years into her acting career, in which she won major roles on Broadway. Along with her stage work, she made several guest appearances on various TV shows throughout the 80s, such as MacGyver and Remington Steel. For the security chief on the station, Pillar wanted to follow in the tradition of Spock and Data in creating an outsider character who looked in at humanity. He described Odo as, the curmudgeon of all curmudgeons. So instead of Data who worships humanity and wants to be that, and Spock who would deny it, Odo has been forced to pass as humanoid his entire life, to look like us and act like us because it's a lot more socially acceptable, and he resents that. Tony Award-winning actor René Aubergenois landed the part. 
Auberginois led an acclaimed stage career since the 1960s, performing opposite other legendary actors such as Frank Langella and Christopher Plummer. He had previously appeared in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country as Colonel West, a small role originally cut from the theatrical version of the film, but restored for the home video release. When he was initially sought out for the character, the actor was hesitant. He said, When the script was first sent to me and I read the description of the character, my daughter said to me, Oh, Dad, yeah, this is yours, you're gonna get this. My kids were completely confident that this part was for me, which, considering the nature of the character, I don't know if I should take as a compliment or not. As production ramped up, Iris Stephen Bear was a little unsure of Aubergenois' casting at first, saying, I was told six months before the series began that Odo was going to be a Clint Eastwood type, and when we started creating the first couple of episodes, we sent writers off to write Clint Eastwood. Then I was told René Aubergenois, and I said, Clint Eastwood, René Aubergenois, Clint Eastwood, René Aubergenois, does not compute. And then I saw what he brought to the role, and I had to call up a bunch of writers and say, guys, I apologize, but this is better than we ever imagined. As the writers came up with these new characters, they wanted to bring in an alien species that had already been established in the next generation. Eventually, they settled on a trill, as previously seen in the TNG episode The Host, Aliens who carry a symbiotic life form, with each host inheriting the memories of previous hosts. The writers enjoyed the idea of a character who looked like a young woman, but who possessed knowledge and wisdom far beyond her years. Actress Terry Farrell landed the role after a nerve-wracking audition. Farrell was already an enormous Star Trek fan, and so jumped at the chance to appear in the latest spin-off, despite finding the alien nature of the role intimidating. Farrell had previously made a number of TV and film appearances, such as in Paper Dolls and Quantum Leap, among others. After being cast, makeup designer Michael Westmore set about adapting the Trill makeup previously seen in The Next Generation, although the results were less than impressive. Many of the producers deemed Terry Farrell too good-looking to be covered up by thick latex pieces, so Westmore decided to adapt a design he had created for Famke Janssen in the TNG episode The Perfect Mate. In keeping with the Western motif, the writers wanted to have a saloon bartender type character, and thought a natural fit for such a character would be a Ferengi. Armin Shimmerman was one of Star Trek's reliable Ferengi performers, having appeared as one of the very first Ferengi in the TNG episode The Last Outpost. Although, after the abysmal first outing for the Ferengi, Shimmerman was pleased to see a more layered character in Quark, and sought to fix the supposed damage he had done to the Ferengi in his initial performance. As I have previously said in my Lore Evolution series, I think Shimmerman was being a bit hard on himself. One of the early relationships the writers were set on establishing relied on the crusty banter between Quark and Odo, overtly inspired by the dynamic between Humphrey Bogart's Rick Blaine and Claude Rain's Captain Louis Renault in Casablanca. Another familiar face in the cast was Irish actor Colm Meaney, made famous in Trek circles for portraying the fan favourite Chief Miles O'Brien. The character and actor was extremely well liked among the writers, and Meany was keen to expand on the role he had so enjoyed playing. For the station's Doctor, at the time the writers had very little in terms of the actual character. The original character brief described in the casting calls and other archive material are pretty bare bones. In keeping with the Western motif, though, the writers envisioned an intelligent scholar type whose naivete is soon tempered by the harsh realities of frontier life. Among those who auditioned for the role was Edward Rawl Higgins, but in the end, the part was given to Sudanese British actor Alexander Siddig. Siddig's full birth name is Siddig El Tahir El Fadil El Siddig Abdaraman Mohammed Ahmed Mohammed Abdel Karim El Mahdi. When he began his acting career, and indeed for the first few seasons of Deep Space, Nine, he was credited as Siddig El Fadil. However, he changed this yet again to Alexander Siddig. Siddig had gained attention for his role as King Faisal in the made for TV sequel to Lawrence of Arabia, a dangerous man, Lawrence after Arabia. This performance caught the eye of Rick Berman, who at first wanted Siddig not for the station's doctor, originally named Julian Amoros, but later changed to Julian Bashir, but instead Berman asked Siddig to audition for the station's commander, Benjamin Sisko. However, he was deemed far too young. For the role of Commander Benjamin Sisko, the producers searched high and low for the right actor. Among those who auditioned were Robert Gwillem, Keith Allen, Pip Torrens, Ralph Brown, Anthony Head, Jolyn Baker, Peter Firth, Nick Brimble, Stefan Khalifa, and even Peter Capaldi. As a quick side note, while researching for this series, I found this picture of Peter Capaldi back in the 70s attending the very first Star Trek convention in the UK, and I just think that's adorable. 
Eventually, a name which the producers were keen on was Avery Brooks, who had previously been considered for Jean-Luc Picard. Brooks had led an acclaimed stage career, particularly for his performance in the one-man show Paul Robeson, as well as a slew of Shakespeare performances. He made his television acting debut as the lead in the Twelve Years a Slave adaptation Solomon Northup's Odyssey. Later, he played the character Cletus Moyer in Roots the Gift alongside LeVar Burton. However, his most recognisable role to TV audiences at the time was as Hawk in the crime drama series Spencer for Hire and its subsequent spin-offs. When his agent first told him he was being considered for a Star Trek role, Brooks apparently burst out laughing and dismissed the idea out of hand, assuming he would be playing an alien and forced to act under heavy makeup. Even after finding out the character was human, Brooks was still unconvinced. After he had received the script, Brooks's wife was the first to read it and insisted he consider auditioning. When he did eventually read it for himself, he was surprised by the high quality of the writing and decided to audition. Allegedly, while on his way to the Paramount lot, his car broke down and he assumed he would lose out on auditioning. But luckily, Berman and Pillar were able to schedule a new audition date. After this one audition, the entire creative staff on the show knew Brooks was the best choice for the role. He was offered the part on the condition he'd do it without a beard and with his hair to clearly distinguish the character from Hawk. This again made Brooks extremely hesitant to accept, but in the end he took the job. He did so after a conversation with his wife and children, in which he recognised the importance of portraying an African-American man in a command position. It's more like a Star Trek soap opera, as the space station turns. Really kind of mediocre at best. Just watch, say, the second half of the second season, and search online for the five to ten best episodes. The whole idea of Star Trek is the idea that they would be exploring new worlds and going where no man has gone before. Not bumming around a space station Watch talking about their feelings. They broke Gene Roddenberry's rules for Star Trek. Anything else is losing precious time you could use for something more pleasant, like breaking each bone in your hand with a rusted hammer. Just like with The Next Generation, Deep Space oh, Nine received yeah. fervent fan backlash after its announcement. For The Next Generation, the backlash was centred on the new cast of characters, but for Deep Space Nine, the backlash surrounded the core concept of the show. A spaceship going boldly where no one has gone before was what defined Star Trek for many people, and so a Trek series stuck on a space station seemed completely ludicrous. As more information about the show became known, the darker tone and grittier setting also angered some fans, who believed Deep Space Nine would be in violation of the all-important Gene's vision of a bright utopian future. Also like the next generation, Deep Space Nine would be released in a first-run syndication format, skipping a primary network and rolling out nationwide on smaller local stations. This once again guaranteed a full first season, beginning with a feature-length pilot episode titled Emissary. For the look of this new show, the production enlisted almost the entire art department from the next generation, including production designer Herman Zimmerman, illustrator Rick Sternak, graphics designer Michael Okuda, and visual effects supervisor Robert Legato, among many others. Because it took some time for the Cardassians to become involved in the backstory of the show, the design of the titular station took quite a while to nail down. We were going in the entirely wrong direction. We wanted something that looked like it might have docking facilities and cargo facilities and it might have layers and layers built upon it. Just wanted something that, that looked very busy and uh, efficient in its attention. own way, but not necessarily, uh, not necessarily 2001 or certainly not Starfleet-ish. In one of uh, Herman's original sketches, uh, he showed a uh, circular hoop-like space station, uh, Herman was under the impression that we would have to rotate it for gravity. Mike Okuda and I gently kidded him about the fact that we've had artificial gravity generators on Star Trek for, uh, for many, many years. Little did we know, however, that, uh, that that hoop design would come back after many, many piles of sketches to become the main design point for the station. It was actually Rick Berman's idea to, to break the, the hoops at the, at the top and the bottom, and that was the final piece that, uh, that, that defined the shape of the space station. For the interior sets, the design team went about creating some truly massive spaces, far larger standing sets than previously used on any Star Trek production. Even though the studio space available meant Zimmerman had to reduce many sets in size, the op set alone was over two stories tall, and the promenade was even larger. 
Emissary was one of the most expensive pilot episodes Paramount Television had ever produced. Because of the sheer scale of the sets, large numbers of extras, makeup designs and visual effects, the cost of the first episode was estimated to be roughly $12 million. David Carson, who had directed a number of TNG episodes including Yesterday's Enterprise, directed Emissary. He worked with cinematographer Marvin V. Rush to create a darker atmosphere for the series, utilizing haze and higher contrast lighting. They also used cranes to move the camera through the massive sets and effectively introduce the audience to these new spaces. The schedule was extremely tight and hours were long, with some regular call times being as early as 4am and not wrapping until 10pm. As production continued, urgent last-minute script revisions put even more strain on the cast and crew, some of whom began referring to the shoot as Deep Shit Nine. Later in the shoot, Patrick Stewart, Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spiner paid a visit to the set and sensing the low morale of the crew, decided to try and lift their spirits by singing, dancing and performing some on-the-spot vaudeville routines, which seemed to do the trick in cheering everyone up. After an arduous month-long shoot, Emissary wrapped principal photography. For the visual effects, the show relied on the now highly experienced in-house team led by Robert Legato. An ambitious sequence at the beginning of the episode depicted the famed Battle of Wolf 359, the aftermath of which was previously seen in The Next Generation. Usually Legato was permitted four days to shoot effects elements for any one episode, but this opening battle alone took 14 days to shoot. Other notable effects included the pioneering use of CGI to create the Bajoran wormhole and Odo's shapeshifting. For the score of the episode and the main theme for the entire series, Dennis McCarthy composed the music. Because of the gritty, run-down nature of the station, McCarthy came up with the idea of a triumphant melody but played only by a single lone horn, illustrating the isolation of the station, but also the potential for hope. After a Herculean effort to finish the premiere episode, the production team felt as if they had learned everything they needed to learn for future episodes of the show. The only question was, would audiences and critics actually like it? On the 3rd of January 1993, the first episode of Deep Space Nine was released. It waits at the edge of the final frontier. It waits for an untested crew to begin an unprecedented journey. But most of all, it waits for you. Star Trek Deep Space Nine. On January 4th, the wait will be over. In contrast to the debut episode of The Next Generation, Emissary is a much more successful pilot episode for the third Star Trek spin-off. The darker tone and grittiness of the show is made crystal clear as the episode begins showing the viewer the famed Battle of Wolf 359 from the other side. While we previously only saw the aftermath of the engagement, here the truly terrifying destructive power of Borg, led by the face of Jean-Luc Picard, hits the audience hard with our new protagonist Benjamin Sisko losing his wife and ship within the opening minutes of the episode. The following act of the episode continues to showcase how much of a departure this new Star Trek show intends to be. Rather than the luxury hotel-like setting of a galaxy-class starship, the titular station is naturally oppressive in its design, run down and crime-riddled with lingering damage from the brutal Cardassian occupation. What stands out most though is the meeting between Sisko and Picard. Knowing the audience likely spent five years already getting to know Jean-Luc Picard in the next generation and holding the character up as a fan favourite, the noble Federation idealist and fatherly starship commander, the natural instinct for any writer would be for these two to meet each other as equals, or for Sisko to sing Picard's praises, echoing the feelings already instilled within the audience. Instead, Sisko's personal trauma and conflicted feelings over his assignment comes out as thinly veiled anger toward Picard. Without overtly stating it, Sisko makes it clear he doesn't want to be in this room with Picard and certainly doesn't want to be running the station. The performances from both actors are simply fantastic, the result of two highly experienced stage and screen actors nailing a strong script. It's a scene which by design leaves a bad taste in your mouth and is once again a metatextual statement about Deep Space Nine as a show. While Picard and Sisko don't get along, the typically warm and fatherly Picard does reappear during O'Brien's departure from the Enterprise. It's a quick scene, nothing overly melodramatic, but it still succeeds in being a touching farewell between the two characters. 
The middle portion of the episode is where Emissary starts to meander somewhat, though nothing to the degree of the blatant padding and encounter of Farpoint. It's a symptom of the episode feeling the need to convey as much setup to the audience as possible. This story and this plot is so clearly centred on Benjamin Sisko that when we are diverted into more expository scenes, it can make the pacing feel a little sluggish. By the time we're halfway through the episode, it still isn't clear where the actual plot is going. That is until the wormhole appears nearby, Sisko makes contact with the bizarre non-corporeal aliens inside it, and a returning Cardassian squadron gears up to attack the hopelessly outmatched station. Here the station is utterly battered by the Cardassian ships, with an emphasis placed on the threadbare resources the crew have to work with and the wounded occupants Bashir has to fight to save. It isn't anything spectacular, but it's a tense action set piece. The true climax of the episode, though, occurs during Sisko's contact with the mysterious alien beings inside the wormhole. In some ways, the dreamlike structure of these scenes resembles the later time shifts seen in All Good Things. Sisko begins the dialogue in total confusion, as does the audience, but over time he manages to piece together the nature of the life forms he's talking to and help them to understand the starkly different existence he experiences. As the exchange continues, the non-corporeal, non-linear nature of the aliens forces Sisko to confront his trauma stemming from the death of his wife. Quite frankly, this is gut-wrenching to watch, with Avery Brooks' performance fully embracing the pain of his character as he attempts to convey the deep sense of loss he feels, fighting to form words with every strained breath. I don't know if you can understand. I see her like this. Every time I close my eyes... <laughs> It took three years for the writers of The Next Generation to bring Picard to this level of emotional vulnerability, but here in Deep Space Nine's very first episode, here was Benjamin Sisko essentially bearing his soul to the audience. I don't know about anyone else, but this moment never fails to make me tear up. As the episode draws to an end, with the station still in one piece and Sisko finally starting to heal, the arrival of new ships and a bustling social scene serve as a signal of hope. Despite how desperate things may seem, and how insurmountable the obstacles, Emissary ends on an optimistic note. Initial reception to the episode was generally strong, and overall much more positive than the mixed reaction to Encounter at Farpoint. It managed to grab an audience of almost 19 million viewers. While a far cry from the 27 million of The Next Generation's debut, this was a more than healthy number of viewers for a new spin-off, which was running concurrently with the definitive incarnation of such an iconic franchise. Season 1 of Deep Space Nine is quite mixed overall compared to its largely strong first episode. Now make no mistake, Deep Space Nine's first year, while not a home run, is a much higher calibre than The Next Generation's first season, which at times was borderline unwatchable. Michael Piller's character-centric storytelling philosophy carries over to Deep Space Nine nicely. As a result, the Deep Space Nine ensemble is overall much better established than their TNG counterparts were in their first year. Despite the notable departures from the next generation though, there is a feeling that early Deep Space Nine was also still relying a little too heavily on some of the tropes the preceding show established. Episodic stories can certainly still work well in this new setting, but a lot of the times it feels like the writers, in attempting to continue with typical Star Trek plots, missed out on some storytelling opportunities unique to this setting. What I mean by this is the continued reliance on planet, alien, or anomaly of the week episodes. In a show like The Next Generation, these kinds of one-off adventures feel perfectly natural as the Enterprise is always in motion, travelling to new places where it can encounter these things. But in Deep Space Nine, in order for these types of episodes episodes to work, the characters either have to take a runabout through the wormhole to visit a new world, or have something come through the wormhole and board the station. Now there's nothing conceptually wrong with this of course, in fact many of these episodic adventures are perfectly enjoyable for the most part, aside from some unfortunate outings like Move Along Home or Culus. But by relying on this particular formula, it's as if the writers were trying to contort Deep Space Nine into the next generation, despite the fact they made conscious choices to differentiate the shows. It all feels a bit counter intuitive. Again, that's not to say these episodes were inherently bad, just a little underwhelming as a use of this new setting for a Star Trek show. However, one notable exception to this is our first highlighted episode, the Kira Nerys-centric 
duet. Kira arrests a Cardassian named Maritza, believing him to be a war criminal due to him having an illness unique to a pejorative labor camp during the Cardassian occupation. However, due to the lack of evidence and Maritza's own denial, Kira and the station team have to probe deeper. At first, the truth seems to have been found when Maritza admits to in fact being Goldar Heel, a mass murderer. But as the investigation continues, not all is as it seems. Star Trek is well known for its historical allegories, and for Duet, the writing team drew direct inspiration from the fallout of the Second World War and the horrific legacy of the Holocaust. Writers Peter Fields and Ira Stephen Bear were heavily influenced by the Robert Shaw adaptation The Man in the Glass Booth in their conception of the script. It's a densely layered story with themes of prejudice, justice, and deep-rooted societal trauma. While there are plenty of intriguing twists and turns, what makes Duet so memorable are the simply incredible two-hander scenes between Nana Visitor and guest star Harris Yulin. When his guise is seemingly destroyed, not only does Darheel not deny his crimes, he revels in them, declaring how proud he is of his work and torturing Major Kira by insisting no matter what the Bajorans do to him, he has already won. The performances from both actors are simply brilliant, with them each delivering their lines like blows in a fight. The way they circle each other during the debates, attacking one another's beliefs, justifying their actions, and Darheel seizing on every opportunity to strike a devastating verbal blow. That's what justified my actions. That's what gave me strength. Nothing justifies genocide. What you call genocide, I call a day's work. The true power of the episode, though, comes from its final twist, when it's revealed the Cardassian prisoner is not Darheel, but is Maritza, a file clerk from the same labor camp so guilt-ridden by his failure to stop the atrocities of his superiors, he chose to disguise himself as Darheel in order to expose Cardassia's crimes and give Bajor some semblance of justice. It's one of the key turning points in Major Kira's character, as she finds herself facing a person she naturally assumed to be her enemy, just as traumatized and haunted by the occupation as many of her own people. Admittedly, the final scene does come off as slightly contrived when a Bajoran bystander murders Maritza on the station promenade, but luckily it doesn't dampen the true scale of the tragedy. Among the cast and crew, the episode was widely regarded as a favorite and earned widespread critical praise as well. Although its first season was a mixed bag overall, Duet Show Deep Space Nine was a show which really had something to say. The finale of season 1 isn't in the same league, but it's an episode which I believe is worth highlighting all the same, in the hands of the prophets. While Keiko O'Brien teaches her class about the science behind the Bajoran wormhole, she is interrupted by a fundamentalist Bajoran Vedic, who demands Keiko either teach the Bajoran religion to her class, or stop teaching the science behind the wormhole. As the dispute escalates, Sisko is placed in a tough position having to reconcile his duties as a Starfleet officer with his status as the Emissary. Drawing on yet more historical parallels, In the Hands of the Prophets evokes the debate which is often seen regarding the content of the American school curriculum, and how big of a role religion plays in it. Writer Robert Hewitt Wolf specifically cited the Scopes trial as a source of inspiration. However, the episode is more broadly about a person or persons forcing their beliefs on others. The episode saw the introduction of Wynne Adami, played by Louise Fletcher. Being most recognizable as the villainous Nurse Ratchet in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Fletcher instills Wynne with a truly detestable personality. Utterly fundamental in her beliefs, but never shy about manipulating and deceiving others to get what she once. What I ultimately respect about the episode, though, is the refusal to outright dismiss religious beliefs as a concept. This is something which wasn't always true in the next generation, as Gene Roddenberry's vision of a utopian future is seen as utopia partly because religion seems to have all but vanished from human society. It's a well-known fact Gene Roddenberry saw religious belief as a roadblock to progress. This attitude is most clearly reflected in episodes like Who Watches the Watchers, in which a society rekindling its belief in a supernatural deity is stated as a sign of regression. Millennia ago, they abandoned their belief in the supernatural. It's too far now you away. are asking me to send them back into the dark ages of superstition and ignorance and fear? No! This is in stark contrast to In the Hands of the Prophets, in which Sisko tries to communicate the importance of religious tolerance. With all this stuff about the Celestial Temple and the Wormhole, it's done. No, it's not. My point is, it's a matter of interpretation. It may not be what you believe, but that doesn't make it wrong. 
While the events of the episode are propelled by religious extremists, the story and the show in general never paints the Bajoran religion or any religion as inherently negative. This episode ultimately succeeds in delivering a nuanced message and sets the stage for some far more complex and thematically rich stories in the show's future. Season 1 wrapped things up on a generally positive note. While it wasn't a smash hit with critics and audiences, the quality of the episodes was far above the largely poor first year of The Next Generation. It managed a regular Hi, audience of 8 you? million viewers, less than its concurrent flagship show, but a healthy sized audience all the same. In the wider pop culture though, Deep Space Nine was seen as the black Off sheep the of the Star Trek franchise in many ways. Both the original series and The Next Generation I've offered the quintessential the Star Trek experience many casual viewers expected of the crew of the Enterprise going boldly where no one has gone before. A stationary Star Trek show telling darker, more complex stories with far more unfamiliar characters didn't capture the wider zeitgeist in the same way. That being said, the viewing figures and generally positive reception were more than enough to guarantee further adventures. Deep Space Nine's second season is still far from the height of the show, but it has a higher frequency of strong episodes, and that goes for both the episodic adventures and more important episodes, which would leave a lasting impact on subsequent seasons. One of the stronger episodic entries this season, however, is Whispers. After Miles O'Brien returns from a conference, he starts to notice a number of suspicious behaviours from those around him. His wife and daughter seem distant and uncomfortable around him, he sees his colleagues talking in hushed whispers behind his back, and his regular duties seem tailor-made to distract him more than anything else. As O'Brien's paranoia builds, he becomes convinced his family and colleagues are in on some kind of conspiracy which he is determined to uncover. Miles O'Brien had become a fan favourite during The Next Generation precisely for his down-to-earth relatable nature, in stark contrast to the angelic superhumans often seen crewing the Enterprise. For this reason, he was also a favourite among the writers and was a perfect fit for the grittier Deep Space Nine. Time was well spent showing us O'Brien's new struggles as he fought to maintain the cobbled together systems of the station, often seen with tools hanging out his pockets and sleeves firmly rolled up. A lot of time was also dedicated to O'Brien's domestic life, with Keiko O'Brien receiving much more screen time. This was arguably the first time an authentic feeling family was depicted in Star Trek. O'Brien wasn't a chisel jawed space adventurer or wise negotiator, he was a blue collar worker, simply trying his best to get by. This is what made O'Brien centric episodes so enjoyable to watch throughout Deep Space Nine, as his everyman perspective came as a breath of fresh air. He was far more vulnerable than many of the other characters, and therefore the threats he faced seemed all the more insurmountable. Whispers is a great use of O'Brien as a character. The script and direction succeed in creating a palpable sense of something not being quite right, a tension which escalates throughout the episode until the final twist. The O'Brien we have been following actually being a clone of the original, something only he was unaware of, is just Twilight Zone to a T. A simple twist, but one which works devastatingly well due to Colin Meany's earnest performance and the likeable nature of O'Brien as a character. Arguably it was whispers which began the torturing O'Brien trend, but continued for the rest of the show. O'Brien-centric episodes became exercises in how to best put the character through absolute hell, such as in season 2's Tribunal and the much later Hard Time. Another character who found their feet in season 2 was Jadzia Dax. The writers have since admitted being a little lost with the character in DS9's first year. Trying to effectively balance the youth of the actress and age-old wisdom of the character proved difficult, and Dax's personality took a long time to really define. At first the writers attempted to create a presence similar to a Audrey Hepburn meets Spock, but this direction didn't satisfy the writers or Terry Farrell. By season 2, it clicked largely by going in the exact opposite direction. Instead of the typically wise, elderly persona expected from a character several centuries old, instead the writers decided to make Dax a wisecracking, ultra-confident party animal and swashbuckler. It was a change which worked brilliantly and led to LeVar Burton while guest directing an episode, giving the character the nickname Action Barbie, something Farrell happily embraced. A great example of how this change opened up more possibilities for the character is Blood Oath. Three legendary Klingon warriors, Kang, Koloth and Kor, arrive on the station to see if Dax is willing to fulfil a Blood Oath taken by Dax's previous host Curzon, the oath in question being to find an exact revenge on a pirate leader who murdered each Klingon warrior's first born son, one of whom was godson to Curzon. 
Longtime Trek fans are gifted with the return of John Colicos, Michael Ansara, and William Campbell, each reprising their Klingon roles from Star Trek the original series. Each one gives a powerhouse performance, and the fact Terry Farrell is never overshadowed by them is quite impressive. The writers finally figuring out what to do with the Dax character, and the actress embracing the new direction, almost serves as a metatextual story for the dramatic tension of the episode. At first, the three Klingons refuse to bring Dax along, believing Jadzia isn't tough enough for the mission, and telling her she isn't beholden to the oath Curzon took with them. Her determination to fulfil Curzon's oath manages to win them over though, and her scientific knowledge actually allowing them to reach their target is illustrative of Dax combining the strengths of her past and present incarnations. Blood Oath also builds on the strengths of Klingon-centric episodes as seen in The Next Generation, with the writers more overtly than ever pulling from the classic epic poems of Homer and Vigil, and combining that style with the rich character-driven stories of William Shakespeare. Just like Whispers, Blood Oath is the birth of one of Deep Space Nine's strongest threads. Outside of the main cast, however, Deep Space Nine was already building up a large ensemble of recurring characters, each of whom were given extra attention thanks to the nature of a stationary series. One of these characters was Garrick, played by Andrew Robinson, a rumoured Cardassian spy who insists he's merely a humble tailor. What made Garrick so memorable was the bizarre glee he seemed to take in deceiving other people. Not only was almost every sentence out of his mouth obfuscating the truth, but he delivered each line with such obvious insincerity he almost begged people to want to know more, even egging them on when they inevitably became frustrated by Garrick's lies. Andrew Robinson instilled the character with so much humour and wit, Garrick was intensely likeable but also totally untrustworthy. As the character made more appearances, a strange bond arose between him and Dr. Bashir, with an implicit romantic tension championed by the two actors and several writers. At first he just wanted to have sex with me. That's absolutely clear. That's all he wanted from me. Come to my shop, I got some nice clothes for you, which you'll have to change first. But then it really got complicated. However, this relationship did come to a head of sorts in the episode The Wire. After a typical lunch date with Bashir, Garrick begins suffering intense head pain. Eventually, the source of the pain is discovered to be a cybernetic device in his brain, which seems to be breaking down. What makes The Wire such a terrific outing for Garrick is the ambiguity. As Garrick's condition deteriorates, his usual defences seem to break down, and he starts to reveal the dark deeds of his past and the reason for his exile from Cardassia. But as the episode goes on, Garrick continues spewing more contradictory stories, further increasing the mystery surrounding his past. In the end, all we know for sure is that he was indeed a Cardassian spy, but that was already obvious from Garrick's first appearance, and we're left wondering if there is a kernel of truth within the numerous stories Garrick told, or if everything he said was another lie. The true magic trick of the episode, though, is how this refusal to open up somehow strengthens the relationship between Bashir and Garrick. A lot is left for the audience to interpret. Perhaps Garrick's painful confession of his past sins, although a lie, is his attempt at pushing Bashir away because he truly does feel a connection to him and doesn't want Bashir to see him suffering. Then again, this could be Garrick attempting to win one last personal victory, to confound the good doctor with yet another made-up tale. Either way, it's an episode filled to the brim with great performances, bristling dialogue, and everlasting entry. What I want to know is, out of all the stories you told me, which ones were true and which ones weren't? They're all true. Even the lies. Especially the lies. One of the more pulpy outings for this season is Crossover. While on their way back from the Gamma Quadrant, a freak accident sends Q When Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, passed away in 1991, the direction of the series changed, and not in any small way either. See, Roddenberry had a very clear idea of what he wanted Star Trek to be. At its heart, his vision of the future was an absolute utopia, a world free of greed, famine, poverty or prejudice. And indeed, this is reflected nicely in the original series and the early seasons of The Next Generation. When he passed away, people naturally started to bend these rules, and the result was Star Trek Deep Space Nine, a more daring and multifaceted kind of Trek than any that had come before it. 
With its more varied cast, deeper themes and unique settings, Deep Space Nine was a momentous leap forward for the franchise and with its changes to the Star Trek formula came many series after it, carrying on the broader vision of the future that had ushered it in. I am Marcus Bronzy, this is Trek Culture and here are 10 welcome changes Deep Space Nine made to the Star Trek formula. Number 10. Adopting characters from past series Admittedly, since the original series and The Next Generation are set a century apart, it would be hard for them to share any of the main cast members, despite many of the original crew still being alive as they shot this. This is not the case with TNG and Deep Space Nine, which run parallel to each other starting from TNG's sixth season. As such, it's easy to see why the writers chose to relocate some of the TNG characters over to Deep Space Nine. The first example of this is Miles O'Brien, a humble transporter operator on the Enterprise D who is at best a minor supporting character on the show. And as a main character in DS9, we see him promoted to Chief of Operations and we get to see some intriguing new sides to his rich down-to-earth personality. Also, Lieutenant Commander Worf, the Klingon fan favourite from TNG, comes to the station in the full season, staying for the remainder of the series. We also get to see a fantastic character development for him in DS9 too, seeing a more gentle side of Worf alongside his usual Klingon self. In this new environment, it's refreshing to see more of these old faces that still have a lot to give. Number 9. Silly Space Fun Not every episode of Star Trek has to be about brain-bending science and intergalactic space battles. Sometimes the crew deserve a little bit of time off from those god-like threats that seem to show up every other day or episode should I say, and the inhabitants of Deep Space Nine know how to wind down better than most. Take the season 7 episode Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite in which Captain Sisko is challenged by a condescending Vulcan crew to a game of baseball in one of the station's hollow suites. Sisko, a lifelong fan of baseball, assembles his own crew into the Niners team and the whole episode is spent following their struggles to get ready for the match. Special shout out to Odo for his You're out of here! There's nothing at stake here besides Cisco's pride. No risk of war, no huge sacrifice if they lose, nothing. It's just a nice bit of playing around away from all of the Trek jargon. We also get to see the team really bond and it's endlessly funny to see these characters way outside of their comfort zones. Other episodes such as the equally hollow sweet heavy bada bing bada bang do this just as well, further emphasizing that strictly adhering to the series iconic formula isn't always necessary. Number 8. A stationary setting I get it, newcomers to the series may initially think how are the crew supposed to boldly go where no one has gone before if they're bumming around all day on a static space station? Evidently, the writers were anticipating this reaction as Deep Space Nine is positioned right next to a wormhole leading to the Gamma Quadrant, a largely uncharted part of the galaxy, making their mission in the name of exploration quite an important one. Many expeditions are made through the wormhole, which is made that much easier by the introduction of the USS Defiant in the third season. And as the new discoveries are made, more and more people make their way to the station, either briefly or for pretty extensive stays. Deep Space Nine has the benefit of having new life and new civilizations come to them, making for a refreshingly homely central hub in the final frontier. Number 7. Older Cultural Concepts with Gene Roddenberry's vision of a utopian future comes an unprecedented opportunity for showcasing ideas and storylines that touch upon the issues reflecting today's culture. Star Trek has always been about equality and diversity and in Deep Space Nine this is shown in a number of daring new ways. In the episode Rejoined, when Jadzia reunites with Lenara Khan, a true woman who formerly married a previous host of Jadzia Dax's symbiote, the two share one of television's first ever lesbian kisses. The message here emphasizes the lack of prejudice and homophobia in the Star Trek timeline in a way that both makes sense in the canon and sends messages to the viewers of the present day. The series also tackles racism in an ingenious multi-episodic arc featuring Benny Russell in a dreamt up embodiment of the black American Captain Sisko in 1950s New York. Benny is a writer who envisions a story of a futuristic space station run by a black captain, but the repeated rebuttal of the idea by his superiors leads to his dismissal and eventually insanity. In a setting where such issues no longer exist, it's commendable of the writers to take us back to a time when they did, showing us how far the people of Star Trek have come from where we as a society seem to still be stuck at at this present time. Number 6. A Main Antagonist Depending on who you ask, it's debatable who this main antagonist is. Is it the Dominion? Is it the Kai of Bajor? 
or Golda Cat, the dangerously unstable Cardassian psychopath. In truth, it really doesn't matter because all three represent something that, until DS9, the Star Trek series had never really seen in the same way before. Sure, the original series had reoccurring enemies like Khan, Harry Mudd, and similarly TNG had the likes of the Borg or Q, but one of DS9's strengths is that it less than focused on the Monster of the Week format, thereby giving rise to a number of adversaries that continue to be ever-growing thorns in Captain Sisko's side. Over time, we see these enemies' goals and personalities change, elevating them from disposable one-episode baddies to real threats of equal significance to the crew of Deep Space Nine. As their plans unfold slowly and organically, it's all the more satisfying when they finally meet their match. Number 5. Gold Press Latinum Much like the stationary setting of DS9, the reintroduction of money into a society that has outgrown the need for it may seem like a step backwards. But it's important to remember though, that there are more than just humans on the space station and one such race, the Ferengi, can't get enough of their much coveted currency, Gold Press Latinum. For the station's Ferengi bartender Quark, Latinum is a huge motivator for almost everything he does. The Ferengi civilization is literally built around its pursuit of wealth, and with its rules of acquisition governing how to maximize profits in any given situation, the crew have been known to, you know, bribe Quark with Latinum to get him to perform tasks he never would otherwise. And the Ferengi aren't the only ones to use Gold Press Latinum, as it appears to be in use all over Deep Space Nine. And whilst money was never something that was missed in the series prior to DS9, it represents new stakes for the characters and new consequences for failure, making an increase in tension whenever it comes into play. Especially with Quark's bar also doubling as a casino of sorts, he definitely knows how to capitalize on this tension. Number 4. Death That Isn't Gratuitous Death of the main characters in Star Trek is not unheard of in any of the series. I mean, the original series had Spock drop off the peg for all of five minutes, and the Next Generation Season 1 character Tasha Yar was killed off with a backhand from a bit of slime. Granted, Jadzia Dax's demise at the hands of Goldu Cat is all of a sudden and rather unceremonious, but given her romantic relationship with Worf as well as her symbiotic nature, the effects of her death are felt throughout the whole of the show's final season in a very unique way. The Dax symbiont is implanted into another true woman named Ezri, and as a result, she gains all of Jadzia's memories along with those of Dax's previous hosts. The closest to Jadzia have a hard time accepting Ezri Dax at first, but with her presence established as an evolution of her predecessor rather than simply a replacement, they gradually come to welcome her as part of the crew. Number 3. Strong Religious Themes This was one of the things that Gene Roddenberry expressly wanted to avoid in his perfect Star Trek vision, and indeed, TOS and TNG largely devoid of anything overly religious. As far as humans are concerned, science and religion are, more often than not, mortal enemies, at least in their real world, but other species have quite a different approach. As discovered in the show's very first episode, there exists a group of mysterious, vastly powerful alien lifeforms that appear in visions to select individuals that they deem worthy. The people of Bajor believe these beings to be prophets and worship them as gods. Major Kira is especially passionate about her faith, which often brings her into conflict with the religious leader of Bajor, Kai Wynn. Oh, hate her! What makes her religion so impactful is that it's shown to have kept her going throughout the Cardassian occupation of her home planet when she was a child. In the face of such brutality, she held on to her beliefs, giving her the strength to endure when her parents were cruelly snatched away from her. Number 2. Animosity Between Main Characters Another of Roddenberry's big no-nos for the series was the idea of interpersonal conflicts between characters on the show, and it was originally non-existent. Despite the original series enjoying the amusing back and forth of Spock and Bones, TNG was intended to feature characters without any ill will towards each other whatsoever. Though an interesting concept in theory, here is one of those many instances where the creator just doesn't know what's best because the occasional row would sneak into TNG after Roddenberry's death and it really became a standard element of the franchise. And in Deep Space Nine, well, it probably goes without saying that the devious Quark rubs a lot of crew members up the wrong way, particularly the station's head of security, Odo. For the entirety of the series, the two polar opposites enjoy a peculiar love-hate relationship, albeit with far more emphasis on the latter. And then there's Kira's aforementioned clashes with Kai Wynn, they're also a prominent recurring motive. And the decision of Quark's young nephew Nog to apply for Starfleet Academy, well, it's quite the point of concentration on board the station. Many other conflicts present themselves throughout the show, providing that extra level of realism to the interactions between such rich and interesting characters. Number 1. Serialized Storylines Now, 
it might not seem like it but this one really is a biggie we're not just talking about end of season episodes to pull you over to the next season the original series and the next generation both followed a formula that largely favored standalone episodes in other words the monster of the week formula which surprise surprise was something else that was in gene roddenberry's book was something that he insisted on this was not a bad thing and is one of the things that helped to draw in so many trekkies then and still helps to draw in brand new trekkies now to this day i mean the fact that you can walk into a room with it on and start watching an episode and kind of understand what's going on without having someone explain it to you having to watch the whole previous set of episodes in the season is quite a fabulous thing but by opening up the possibility of longer more complex story arcs deep space nine's writers tapped into a whole new level of depth within the series over the course of the show, there are multiple intricate and interwoven storylines, including the role of Captain Sisko as the emissary chosen by the prophets, the looming threat of the Dominion, Odo's quest to discover who or what he really is, and Gold Ducat's descent into an obsessive, murderous madman. Although TNG planted some of these seeds first, it's Deep Space Nine that took them and turned them into deep, overarching themes that one single episode couldn't hope to cover. And as each of these predicaments are dealt with one by one on screen, their impact and scope often leaves you wondering, but how much work is left to do? Perhaps a future Star Trek show will provide all of those answers. Well, there you have it. 10 welcome changes Deep Space Nine made to the Star Trek formula. What are yours? Let us know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to drop us a like and sub. On October 30th, 2012, Walt Disney announced the acquisition of Lucasfilm for over $4 billion. It was a deal in the making for over a year when George Lucas first told Disney president Bob Iger about his plans for retirement. The deal gave Disney ownership of all of Lucasfilm's operating businesses, entertainment technologies, the intellectual property of Indiana Jones, and of course, Star Wars. Longtime Hollywood producer Kathleen Kennedy was appointed the president of Lucasfilm and quickly announced the production of new Star Wars films, beginning with Episode 7. At this time in 2012, The Clone Wars was still on Cartoon Network and well into its fifth season. Many fans were initially nervous about the fate of The Clone Wars under Disney's ownership and if it would remain on a competing Time Warner-owned network. What ended up happening was far worse. On March 11th, 2013, an article was published on Stars.com entitled A New Direction for Lucasfilm Animation. After five critically acclaimed seasons on Cartoon Network, Lucasfilm announced that the production of Star Wars The Clone Wars would be winding down. Two unassuming words that were doublespeak for cancellation. The announcement promised that new Clone Wars episodes were on the way in the form of bonus content, but it failed to specify how many new episodes there would be and if the series would reach its intended finale. And aside from the additional announcement that Seth Green's Star Wars detours would be postponed, again, canceled, that was everything the article stated. For this announcement to arrive only a little over a week after Ahsoka left the Jedi Order in the season five finale, the sudden cancellation of the show felt like a stab in the back. All these years later, I'm still puzzled about the wording and briefness of the article and why the cancellation of the show was treated with such a casual, hands-off tone. I think Disney failed to recognize how passionate and vocal the show's fanbase was and completely misjudged their response. Even then, 13-year-old me was confused and conflicted, hesitant to believe that the cancellation was for the best. This leads us to a question that I've been eager to answer from the very first video when I started doing research for this series. Why was The Clone Wars cancelled? Truthfully, there's no definitive explanation for the show's cancellation, and there may never be. However, there are several likely reasons the show ended when it did, and a few different perspectives from creators who were involved in the show over the years. Because The Clone Wars was on a competing televised network, Disney had no interest in letting Cartoon Network continue airing Clone Wars episodes. This opened the door to putting Clone Wars on Disney XD, a network that, despite what you might hear, has almost the exact same intended age range as Cartoon Network. Even in 2016, the 20th season of Pokemon, which previously aired on Cartoon Network, was moved to Disney XD. So why didn't that happen with the Clone Wars? Over the course of the show, we know Lucas dedicated about one to two million dollars per episode, which is above average compared to the spending of most animated TV shows. It's possible that by season five, the show cost even more than this because of pay raises. This measly $4 billion purchase of Lucasfilm may be nothing to scoff at compared to the $52 billion plus dollar purchase of 21st Century Fox, but it was quite literally a big deal for Disney in 2012. 
Though Lucas Executive produced the show's fifth and sixth seasons due to how far they were in production before the sale of Lucasfilm, the sale of Disney relinquished him of that role and presented Disney with a choice. Do we continue to produce The Clone Wars with a sky-high budget, or do we find a cheaper way to produce Lucasfilm animated content to an already built-in market? It seems that even months before the official cancellation of the show, Disney had made their choice. On May 20th, 2013, Lucasfilm Animation announced the production of Star Wars Rebels for Disney XD. Dave Filoni would be the showrunner, and many of his creative leads would carry over from The Clone Wars. While this seemed like some sort of promising follow-up, behind the scenes, Lucasfilm Animation was undergoing turbulent change. The studio was hit with at least two waves of layoffs, first to its crew departments, and then to the distribution and licensing departments. Even during Rebels' early development, members of Lucasfilm Animation had plans to leave the studio, including Darren Marshall, the lead character sculptor for the entire duration of The Clone Wars. There's practically zero data on the internet as to what Rebels' initial episodic budget was, but we do know that the first episode was completed in under a year, with the rest of the season likely completed in a similar space of time per episode. In comparison, the average time of development period from start to finish of a Clone Wars episode was two to three years. Even from a subjective judgment of the show's art style, everything we know suggests that Rebels had a much lower budget than Clone Wars, and that's exactly what Disney wanted. It might also be worth noting that every episode of Rebels has a rating of TVY7, which is lower than the Clone Wars TV PGV. In 2018, Daniel Logan, who played and voiced young Boba Fett in the show, felt that the Clone Wars was taken off the air because it was getting too graphic. Though I'm less inclined to believe that it was the reason the show was cancelled, it's hard to deny that the Clone Wars wasn't pushing its age rating in later seasons. It's possible Disney wanted to moderate what Lucasfilm was getting away with on a TV PGV rating in their new show. And then there's the element of George Lucas. Or I should say, the lack of it. If the Clone Wars continued, Lucas would not have been involved, and that might have not felt right to the entire Hi, studio. The Clone Wars was Lucas' story after all. When Lucasfilm Animation said they felt it was the right time to move on from the Clone Wars, that may very well have been the whole truth, as sad as it sounds. Or maybe it wasn't, and that was just their way of making the best of a situation that was chosen for them by Disney. DC. We just don't know. I've always been more of an artist than a businessman, so I have very little tolerance for what happened to the Clone Wars under Disney's ownership. It was a surefire way to cure Bad Willow with one of the most passionate and loyal fan bases almost right from the get-go of the purchase. One could argue that the Clone Wars was part of what made Star Wars the appetizing brand that it was at the time of Lucas's retirement. It helped keep Star Wars from becoming a stagnant IP, so to speak, like Terminator, Back to the Future, even Indiana Jones. If it weren't for the Clone Wars, Rebels would certainly not exist, and would have not been produced at the speed and efficiency of a studio as experienced as Lucasfilm Animation. And perhaps, even if it weren't for the Clone Wars, Lucasfilm wouldn't have Dave Filoni, arguably the most important figure in Star Wars storytelling today. Nevertheless, the spark was out. The Clone Wars was over. Save for one final season of bonus content. This is the legacy of Star Wars The Clone Wars. On March 7th, 2014, a whole year after the last televised episode of the show, Star Wars The Clone Wars The Lost Missions released on Netflix along with the entirety of the series. This final season consisted of 13 episodes that were deemed too far along in production to be completely shafted. It was less than what was hoped for, but more than what was expected. If The Clone Wars movie Season 1 and most of Season 2 show us a galaxy divided in a black and white conflict, and Season 3 through 5 show us the blurring of that conflict, then Season 6 shows us a galaxy entering a point of no return. It's the beginning of the end for the show's many characters and themes, and where exactly they fall in Palpatine's grand chess game. The first of those this season would be the clones. Bred solely for war and invariably for death, we've watched the clones struggle to find meaning in their hopeless existence over the course of several conflicts. There is of course the external conflict of the Republic versus the droid army, but more than that, the clones have faced several internal conflicts as well. Independence versus obedience, brotherhood versus banner, and in the opening arc of season 6, agency versus programming. In another sense, man versus machine. The Jedi and 501st are beleaguered in a never-ending assault over Ringo Vinda, just one of the many never-ending battles that occur near the end of the Clone Wars. In a sudden and shocking move, Tup, the wet behind the ears, promising 501st trooper we saw in Umbara, snaps and kills Jedi Master Tiplar. Sister! 
For the first time in the show, the system that runs the war encounters a glitch, and it rears a disturbing hierarchy of classified cover-ups and secrecy. If you've seen Revenge of the Sith, you may already know where this is going, but because the characters haven't, we're going to rediscover it in agonizing detail from the most heartbreaking perspective possible. Fives. Since Season 1, Fives has been a beacon of independence among the clones. From his defiance to be called by his number in training, to his unwavering descent with General Krell on Umbara, Fives is fueled by all the things that make him more than just a soldier. There's no question he'd stick his neck out for Tup when he goes to Kamino. Much like the clash between the idealized Republic and True Republic that Ahsoka experiences in Season 5, Fives faces a similar string of realizations between the open and nurturing view of Shakti and the Jedi to the cold and guarded structure of the Kaminoans. Where Aurelian influences were presented visually in the Season 5 Ahsoka arc, here Katie Lucas presents Orwellian ideas through a conspiracy plot narrative. Fives has fed a deliberate stream of misinformation from the seemingly robotic Kaminoans, trapped in the isolating sterility of their cloning facility. Instead of 2 plus 2 equals 5, it's good soldiers follow orders. Through Katie Lucas' writing, Kamino has been completely recontextualized into a stark white nightmare. Every revelation Fives encounters leads to more questions than answers, and pursuing those answers involves greater and greater risk. This not only creates more suspense for us as a viewer, but draws us closer and closer to the character of Fives. He's motivated both by the desire to get to the bottom of the brain chip conspiracy, as well as to prove the independence of clones. They're not just products, they're human beings. The characters of AZ-3 gives Fives the chance to prove his thesis, and in a surprisingly comical way. Fives convinces AZ to defy their programming and seek out the truth. Their antics provide much needed levity for this arc, and prove what's true of not just the clones, but characters like R2-D2, C-3PO, or even BB-8. They're more than just their programming. In a broader sense, it echoes a theme at the core of the Star Wars saga, that you're more than just your bloodline. But this house of cards is bound to fall, and that's exactly what happens in Orders. No. Where were we? Fives is given an audience with Chancellor Palpatine on Coruscant and learns the horrifying truth. Over the next 15 minutes, we watch Fives go through what is probably best described as an existential crisis. This human being who has built their entire existence on the notion that he's not programmed, that he can make choices for himself, that he is unique, has his entire worldview shattered. We're never shown exactly what Palpatine tells Fives, and we can probably infer it, Yet watching Fives' peril is all the more captivating, not knowing exactly what he heard. There's an additional layer of ambiguity to Fives' sheer madness. Is this because he was drugged at the start of the episode, or is it really because his chip was removed? Though uncertain, what is certain is that Fives is trapped and alone, manifested in the warehouse conversation with Rex and Anakin. This is probably D. Bradley Baker's best performance moment in the whole series, bringing dimension to Fives' manic suffering. Then. In a final betrayal to everything Five stands for, Commander Fox kills Five. Five! 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 Five's death is easily the most tragic in the entire series. In writing this video, I watched his death back to back with Top's death and noticed something peculiar. It's visually hinted that several clones on some level have had nightmares about Order 66, the mission, as they call it. The fact that it's the last thing Tup and Fives are called before dying, and the bittersweet peace that it brings them recontextualizes Order 66 and the Jedi Purge like never before. Before the Clone Wars, Order 66 felt partially motivated by the Jedi's apathetic treatment of the clones. But here, and throughout the rest of the show, it's plain to see the clones are victims. It makes the fall of the Republic, the death and betrayal of thousands of people, more personal and heartbreaking than ever before. Oh, no. Moving on to the Clovis arc of Season 6, this is the final political arc of the show and places another crucial puzzle piece in Palpatine's grand takeover of the Republic. The world of Scipio and its banks are evidently inspired by Switzerland, just as the sled chase action sequence feels inspired by On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Clovis was previously characterized as something of a separatist sellout to form a love triangle between Anakin and Padme. But here, Clovis earns a shot at redemption. A man who, from since he was a boy, has been destined to control the banks. 
He might just be worthy enough for Padme, his old flame. That is, if it wasn't for this guy. Whether it's because of the films or Lucas's hesitance to revisit it, Anakin and Padme's relationship has always been more of a background feature in the Clone Wars than something to actually be explored. But this political arc doubles as a deconstruction of what really appears to be a very toxic relationship. In the past, Anakin's jealousy was either played for laughs or used for momentary suspense. Though as Anakin has become a more complex character over the course of the show, there are serious ramifications for Anakin's behavior. Anakin is afraid to lose his attachments and will fight just to keep them. We've seen that, and we see it here in an appropriately brutal way. Deep down, Anakin is still bound to his goodness, capable of seeing his wrongs. However, the reality of what is actually a secretive, distrustful, and unhappy marriage can no longer be ignored. It's an inversion of the last time we saw Anakin, Padme, and Clovis. Instead of rooting for Anakin and Padme, we feel tempted to root against it. At least, I did. Both the collapse of the banking clan and the fate of Anakin Padme's marriage comes full circle by the end. Dooku helps Clovis achieve his destiny, only to bring war to the neutral Scipio and ruin his well-earned redemption. Anakin also rushes to Scipio, not just to save Clovis, but to save Padme to redeem his marriage. And so, in the Clone Wars' latest edition of Death From High Up, Anakin must choose between his redemption or Clovis's, until the choice is made for him. I'm sorry, Padme. By the end of the arc, the rockiness of Anakin and Padme's relationship is only momentarily resolved, and Palpatine seizes full control of the banks. The Clone Wars has practically made a ritual of using the most upstanding people as scapegoats for an unstoppable new order, and that's exactly what happens to Clovis. It furthers the tragedy and the emotional turmoil of the Republic's imminent doom. As for Anakin and Padme, the story lends a perspective both more relatable and meaningful than the unbreakable bond the characters share in the films, and deepens the inner conflict between good and evil raging within Anakin Skywalker. Much needed levity is provided in the two-part Disappeared episodes, where Mace Windu and Jar Jar Binks investigate a cult disappearance on Bardota. Unlike the other arcs we've discussed, there's not very much depth to these episodes. It's Temple of Doom in Star Wars. Jar Jar gets a love interest. Mace battles Talzin with a flaming sword. All the Bardotans have Indian accents. It turns into a buddy comp adventure with Mace and Jar Jar. The whole thing perfectly captures the feeling of a pulpy Saturday morning cartoon, and that's why it's great. The Clone Wars is never concerned with filling the gap between episode two and three, so much as it aims to tell any and every story it can, no matter how unexpected. No one could have predicted a story like this to ever be told in Star Wars, but here it is. I think it serves as both a testament to the imagination of Lucas, Filoni, and the writers, as well as just how likable Jar Jar can be. At least a little bit. Let's get moving. <laughs> and last but not least, we're brought to the final arc of the Clone Wars, the Yoda arc. The story begins with Plo Koon investigating a long lost signal. A piece of lore, if you will, long overlooked by both the fans and the creators of Star Wars, sifo -Dyas. I try not to get too caught up in the lore of Star Wars in these videos. I prefer to focus on the stories being told, how those stories affect the audience. But much like the Order 66 arc that began the season, this arc largely revels in the great mysteries of Star Wars lore and attempts to evoke both our intrigue and imagination from those mysteries. There's also manipulation of Albert Hitchcock's bomb theory that I mentioned in my previous video, except it's how the Jedi uncover the true nature of the Clone Wars and their eventual downfall. It's a startling revelation not just for the Jedi, but also the viewer, who feels a sense of dread for everything the Jedi will go through. Win the war swiftly, we must. Before our enemies' designs reach completion, whatever they may be. Are you sure we are taking the right path? Hmm. The right path? No. The only path? Yes. But that's just the first episode. The rest of the arc is something of an intergalactic odyssey, and an ambitious attempt to test the character of Yoda, someone who's always been seen as the wise old sage, the one who's learned every lesson that can be learned. Our faith in Yoda's constancy is what makes his unsettling reaction to hearing Qui-Gon's voice and the journey he embarks on so impactful. What Yoda goes through in these episodes defines the hard-written rules of Force lore. It's neither as vague as an energy that binds all living things, nor as specific as midichlorians. Rather, it's something indescribable and very beautiful. There's a whimsical sense of adventure as Yoda begins his journey, 
his trust in Anakin to break him out of the temple that exposes Yoda's rare humanity. All the serenity and wonder that accompanies Yoda is visually and very audibly met with an unspeakable, all-consuming evil on Dagobah, on the Force World, on Moorband. Throughout the arc, the animators lean heavily into creating abstract environments that breathe, creatures from your worst nightmares, placing Yoda in visually intense scenarios. There are dozens of frames that feel like paintings, all because of the sheer detail poured into them. But perhaps most astonishing to me all these years later is how these episodes put Yoda on a trial at the very core of Lucas's mythology, choosing to be selfless or selfish. The Clone Wars has given the Jedi plenty of reasons to be selfish, to be selective in the suffering of millions. By fighting the war, they've already lost. But in Sacrifice, in one of the show's most captivating sequences, Yoda's given the ultimate choice. This scene opens on a 70 second one take, grounding Yoda in a scenario where Dooku and Sidious have been spotted on Coruscant, preparing him for the ultimate choice. Anakin kills Dooku, just as he does in Revenge of the Sith, and Yoda fights Sidious, but this is where his choice comes in. Captain, I will not be. Sacrifice all I am ready to do. In spite of what Anakin will become, the evil that will consume him, Yoda chooses to save Anakin, to believe in Anakin. An unshakable belief in redemption, the very same belief that guides Luke in Return of the Jedi. Yoda emerges from this trial somehow more wise, more optimistic in the ways of the Force. It's too late to stop the Sith, too far gone in the suffering and loss of the Clone Wars. Yet, as Yoda asserts, there is hope. No longer certain that one ever does win a war. I am. For in fighting the battles, the bloodshed, already lost we have. Through this path, victory we may yet find. Not victory in the Clone Wars, but victory for all time. The Clone Wars triumphantly ends on a profoundly hopeful note, the final shot resting on the flower of a tree. A flower that may wither and fall away with the changing times, but will one day bloom into something beautiful. At the time of the show's cancellation and sixth season, there were about 52 unproduced episodes, or 13 four-part arcs, the details of which we've learned over the years from various star celebrations, Lucasfilm insiders, and Dave Filoni himself. All of these episodes had fully written scripts and were at different stages of production before the